And the 2004 Tony Award for Best Musical goes to Avenue Q. Avenue Q. Avenue Q. After the harsh blow of losing the Tony Award for Best Musical, Wicked's future briefly seemed uncertain. Losing the Tony can be the kiss of death for some Broadway shows. Luckily, it wouldn't be for Wicked. The show's fan base continued to grow, and tickets were selling out fast. By the end of 2004, Wicked was the top-selling Broadway show of the year, beating out Disney's Lion King and recent mega-hit The Producers. But Wicked would soon face another dilemma. With Kristen Chenoweth's departure in July of 2004 and Adina Menzel's memorable farewell in January 2005, some wondered if Wicked would still be able to fill the massive Gershwin Theater night after night. Was the show strong enough to sustain losing its two main attractions? Or would it follow the same road as the producers? While the Mel Brooks musical was a record-breaking phenomenon when it first opened, it never regained its spot at the top of the box office once original stars Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick left the show. But Wicked would soon prove just how popular it really was. By 2005, Wicked Mania was reaching an all-time high. Wicked's Grammy Award-winning cast recording brought Stephen Schwartz's new musical into homes all around the world, increasing demand for tickets and making Wicked on Broadway a virtual sellout for months in advance. With ticket demand far exceeding what the Gershwin Theater could accommodate, it was announced that Wicked would be hitting the road across North America. The show launched its first national tour in Toronto, Canada on March 8, 2005, with Kendra Kassenbaum as Glinda, and as Elphaba, none other than Stephanie J. Block. Block chose to go on tour rather than replace Adina Menzel on Broadway, saying, I really wanted to flesh out this character in my own way, as opposed to having to fill Adina's shoes and what she had already established with the Broadway company. Tell them how I am defying gravity. I'm flying her, defying gravity, and soon I'll match them. Just like the Broadway production, Wicked became a hit on the road often selling out tickets in major cities in just a few days and having extremely positive effects on the economies of the cities the show visited. Demand for Wicked was so high that a second national tour launched just four years later in 2009, running concurrently with the first national tour. And even that wasn't enough to keep up with the demand for Wicked. Over the years, Wicked has had sit-down productions in Chicago, Los Angeles, and San Francisco in addition to its two national tours. Wicked was completely dominating North America and had no plans of stopping there. On July 12, 2006, an abridged 30-minute production of Wicked opened at the Universal Studios Japan theme park. The show, held in the Land of Oz section of the park, marked the first time Wicked was performed in any capacity outside of North America. The role of Elphaba was typically played by an American or Australian actress, while the role of Glinda was always played by a Japanese actress. The show was mostly in Japanese, with about 30% of the dialogue and music in English. The show ran for five years until 2011, when the entire Land of Oz section of the park was closed. On September 7, 2006, Wicked launched its first full international production at the Apollo Victoria Theatre in London's West End, 
Idina Menzel would open the West End production as Elphaba for a limited engagement through December 30th. This time she'd have a proper final performance. No red tracksuit required. London critics were no less mixed than New York critics about the show. London audiences didn't have the same love for The Wizard of Oz as American audiences, so many were skeptical of its chances at success. But once again, Wicked proved critics wrong, becoming a record-breaking smash in the West End just as it had on Broadway. The West End production implemented several changes to the show that were later carried over into all productions of Wicked. Changes included a brief new scene where Elphaba and Fierro meet for the first time, restructuring the wizard's song Wonderful, and the elimination of the show's original opening image. There's a giant witch hat that had all the ensemble members underneath the witch hat and a giant point. I was the point of that witch hat. Which meant that at the top of the show I had to lie on my belly underneath the giant witch hat tarp, and then I had this pole that was going down into a hole into under the stage and they would push it up to me and I would have to hoist this pole up, rest it on my belly and go like this while they spun around me, then take the pole and throw it into this tiny little hole and jump out just in time to sing good news. And I hated it. <laughs> I was like, here's a Juilliard to lay on the floor and hold a pole. But you know what, at the end of the day, we always said, at least I'm not a flathead or a monkey. The witch hat was replaced by a giant projection of Elphaba towering over the citizens of Oz. Since its international debut, Wicked has been translated into multiple languages all over the world, with productions in Australia, Brazil, the Netherlands, Mexico, Japan, Germany, South Korea, New Zealand, and beyond. In 2010, a non-replica production of Wicked opened in Finland. It would be the first production not to utilize Eugene Lee's iconic set design or Susan Hilferty's costumes, giving the show a unique look all its own. Wicked was quickly on its way to becoming a pop culture phenomenon. As with any piece of pop culture, references to Wicked began to pop up in TV shows, movies, and other Broadway musicals. Everyone from The Simpsons to South Park to SNL has referenced Wicked in one way or another. It's never whatever I want. It's fine. When I wanted to see Stomp and you wanted to see Wicked, what did we see? We saw loathing. There's a strange exhilaration in such total detestation. It's so pure and strong. When Wicked closes, I have very limited job options. I mean, look at me. Well, you're green. Maybe you could be in Shrek the musical. Wow, that's racist. No. And no one's gonna bring me down. I can guess your whole agenda. You be healthy, I'm Kalinda. What the? Holy crap. Smile, buddy. We're on Broadway. Who can say oh. if I've been changed for the better? Because I knew you. Because I knew oh. you. Because I knew you. I have been changed for good. That'll do, pig. Excuse me? Wicked even found its way onto the Billboard Hot 100 when pop star Miko released popular song featuring Ariana Grande in 2013. Wicked's influence goes beyond call-outs, references, and song sampling. When Disney released their blockbuster Frozen in 2013, the film drew immediate comparisons to Wicked. Both focus on the friendship of two women. Both feature a protagonist with special powers that makes them feel isolated and misunderstood. And Frozen's breakout song, Let It Go, shares some major DNA with Wicked's defying gravity, starting with the fact that both are sung by Adina Menzel. Besides the obvious Menzel connection, Frozen has another connection to Wicked. Robert Lopez wrote the music and lyrics for Frozen along with his wife, Kristen Anderson Lopez. Robert Lopez previously worked with Jeff Marks to write the music and lyrics for the show that beat Wicked at the Tony Awards, Avenue Q. But Frozen wouldn't be the only time Disney took inspiration from Wicked. The 
2013, Disney released an Oz prequel of their own titled Oz the Great and Powerful. Like Wicked, the film gives a backstory of how the Wicked Witch of the West came to be. Deep down, you are wicked. You are not wicked! <laughs> And in 2014, Disney released an origin story of their own for their most iconic villain, Maleficent. Well, well. The success of Wicked inspired Broadway producers to back even more female-led shows with themes of empowerment. While some of these shows may have eventually come to Broadway without Wicked, there's no question that many of them sought after the same demographic that made Wicked a hit. With Wicked's obvious impact on film, television, and beyond, a film adaptation of its own seemed inevitable. For years, fans have waited in anticipation for a Wicked film to come to fruition, with some advocating for it to be an animated film. In 2010, Universal took the first steps by beginning production on a Wicked film by interviewing top film directors. By 2012, the Wicked team had settled on director Stephen Daldry to helm the project. Daldry was best known for directing Billy Elliot, both on film and on stage. Universal set a tentative release date for 2016, but as 2016 got closer and the film was still stuck in development, the date was changed. On June 16, 2016, Universal announced that the Wicked film would be released on December 20, 2019, even going so far as to post a photo of Wicked's logo with the date below it. But by 2018, it was announced that the film was once again delayed. Instead, the December 2019 release date would be given to a different movie musical. Right, well that's not going to work, is it? In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic rocked the entire entertainment industry, causing major delays for movie studios and forcing massive schedule changes. Because of this, Stephen Daldry dropped out of the project, putting the Wicked movie back at square one. But on February 2nd, 2021, it was announced that director John M. Chu had been chosen to replace Daldry. Chu is best known for directing the critical and box office hit Crazy Rich Asians, as well as the highly anticipated big screen adaptation of the Broadway musical In the Heights. In a post on Instagram, Chu stated, To think that I have been invited to bring this timeless story to the biggest screens all around the world is like I've been invited to Oz by the wizard himself. I will protect this vigorously and hopefully bring a few new surprises along the way. So, who wants to be Elphaba and Glinda? The roles of Elphaba and Glinda have become two of the most iconic and coveted roles on Broadway. The incredible performers who've stepped into these roles over the years have gone on to even greater success, with a number of Tony nominees and winners amongst them. Laurel Harris joined Wicked in 2011. Harris first saw Wicked during a trip to New York with her family. It was a moment that would change her life. We, we went to the box office. Um, they didn't have any seats except for one in literally the nosebleed section all the way in the back of the balcony. And, and my mom really wanted to go, and but she knew how much I wanted to go. And she said, you know what, you go. We're going to get you that ticket. And they got me that ticket, and I went and saw Wicked by myself the year that it opened in December. And I saw the original cast, and I was sitting in that chair just like jaw drop, awestruck, mesmerized. And the curtain came down after defying gravity and I literally couldn't move and I started crying and I called my mom who was you know in the hotel a couple blocks away and I said mom I have to do this show one day and I know I know now that I need to pursue musical theater because that is what I want to do I've never felt that way ever in my whole life watching something I always credit that moment of seeing Alphaba flying in Defying Gravity as like the moment that I knew that I really had, I must pursue this. Eight years later, Harris joined the ensemble of Wicked's first national tour and understudied Alphaba. Her first time going on as the Green Girl was a day she'll never forget. I was on tour in Eugene, Oregon. It was Easter Sunday. I woke up that day, I put on my Sunday dress and I went to church. I put my phone on silent because that's what you do at church. At the end of the service, they asked people if they wanted to come up and sing the Hallelujah Chorus, which I love to do. And then the service ends and the woman next to me turned to me and she said, oh my gosh, you have such a beautiful voice. Are you from around here? Or we've never seen you here before. And I said, oh no, actually I'm here on, I'm on tour. I'm with the show Wicked. And she said, oh my gosh, Wicked, that's so cool. And anyway, so then I go back to my phone and I 
see that I have like 17 missed calls from my PSM. And I'm going, uh-oh. <laughs> so I, I check my messages and he's like, Laurel, you're on, you're on. You are, you're making your alphabet debut today. And so this woman that I had just met in the, the choir loft, of course, I didn't have anyone else to tell. So I turned to her and I said, ah, I just found out I'm gonna be alphabet today for the first time in my life. I'm so excited. <laughs> and she goes, oh my gosh, we gotta get you to the theater. How are you gonna get there? And I was just gonna walk. She said, no, no, no. If you're comfortable, I will drive you. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> We're on our way to the theater and my mom calls me. I was getting ready to tell her like, I'm going on for Alphabet. And she, but before I could see that, she called and she sounded really sad. And she said, well, I'm so sorry to call you. I know you're about to do your matinee, but um, I have to tell you that your aunt Kathy just passed away. And of course I was like deflated immediately. She said, are, are you okay? And, and I said, well, I just found out I'm gonna play Alphaba. And she said, well, you'll do it for Kathy you know, and she'll be there with you. We get to the stage door and this woman, she just says, break a leg, I'll be thinking of you, I'll be praying for you, you're gonna do great. And I turned to her and I said, I can't thank you enough, you have been such an earth angel. I didn't even get your name, what's your name? And she said, I'm Kathy. And I, I was like, okay. <laughs> From that moment, I felt like I wasn't worried at all. I, I, felt, I felt like I was just being lifted. I remember it because she was with me and and it was incredible. Harris would go on to take over the role full time on the national tour and in 2018 she'd take her Elphaba to Broadway. Jenna Claire Mason joined the Wicked team in 2015. Like Laurel Harris, Mason also saw Wicked during a family trip to New York and the dream job was born. The concierge lady at the Hilton Suites in Midtown said, to me and my dad, you should really take your daughter to see this show. It just opened. It's really popular. <laughs> um, it's called Wicked. You should go see it. Anyways, we went. We tried to get last minute tickets. It was sold out. <laughs> so it didn't work. We went back the next day. We stood in line for the lottery and didn't win. But as the lo last lottery name was called, I scurried inside and was first in line at kind of the will call cancellation spot. And we were the next people in line to get tickets. And I sat in the fourth row and saw the original cast of Wicked on Broadway. And what really sticks out to me is Kristen. I mean, first of all, in the bubble, but then also just those costumes. My gosh. And laughing and just loving every moment of it and feeling like I was in heaven. And I had seen my first Broadway show several years before that, Les Mis, and was kind of like, this is what I want to do for a living. And it wasn't until I saw Wicked that I said, you know, of all the jobs I could possibly think of, that's the one I want to do. So I told my parents at intermission that I wanted to be Glinda someday. I think my parents were kind of like, yeah, yeah, do that. Also, I'm sure you and every other little girl like, really wants to do that. After graduating college and nearly three years of grueling auditions, Mason's dream to fly in the bubble finally came true, becoming the standby for Glinda on Broadway. My first show was the day before Thanksgiving. It was November 26, 2015. And I was standing by for Kara Lindsay, and I've always said this, and I will just keep saying it, I could stand by for her for the rest of my life. She's a dream. I can't imagine a better way to have kind of kicked off my wicked journey than, than learning from a comedic genius and just kind-hearted soul. My first show, I, I do remember pieces of it. It did feel a lot like a blackout <laughs> because you're just you're so intensely focused. My Broadway debut was opposite Rachel Tucker. She is an amazing, gracious, giving human and also scene partner. And something I remember really vividly about my first show was for good, because you know, you've been running, 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 running on for two and a half hours. And then you get to plant yourself and just kind of engage with this, this person opposite you. And um, if you're a Rachel Tucker fan, you know she has these crazy crystal blue eyes. And I so vividly remember her blue eyes against that green paint 
and how dazzling they were. And I was like, we're here. We did it. Like, you know, at that point, there's just a little bit left in the show. So it was kind of that, oh, we're almost there. Wow, wow, wow. I'm one under my belt. Mason would take over the role of Glinda in the national tour in 2017. And in 2019, she'd take over the role on Broadway. Wicked's leading ladies all share a special connection, whether they've done the show together or not. Alphabas and Glendas, you know, once you've done it, you know, and there's this, there's this sisterhood, there's this bond of understanding. And even if you don't know each other personally, it's like, oh yeah, we know, we know how that goes. Oh, we can talk about that trapdoor and oh, how ridiculously hard it is to climb that ladder with that really long dress at the end of the show. And you share this, um, this mutual understanding. So it's really special. You know, Glinda's have, I think, a special sisterhood. I've definitely learned so much from the Glinda's before me. And having that kind of sisterhood of, of wisdom and care and support is really, really special. And I know the same is true for the Alpha Buzz. But the bond you form with the person playing opposite you on stage is something that's so incredibly special and I dare say magical. I've gotten to play opposite some amazing women, Laurel Harris included, and Jessica Vosk, and Rachel Tucker, and Alyssa Fox, and I can't answer this question without mentioning Mary-Kate Morrissey because she has been my longest running Elphaba that I've played opposite of. We played uh, the roles opposite one another on the road for almost a year and she is my best friend, she is my sister, and I know our friendship offstage really informed our onstage relationship and vice versa. I think there's this mutual respect and understanding between the person playing Glenda and the person playing Alphaba is that you're both tackling these epic roles and that you are there for each other and there is this trust and, and care and almost, you know, being incredibly present to the other person's needs, that you have a unique opportunity because you spend so much time together on stage to really care for one another throughout. But I'm, I'm so grateful for all of my Alphaba sisters, for sure. On October 29th, 2018, NBC aired a very wicked Halloween, celebrating 15 years on Broadway. The special featured performances by Ledacy and Adam Lambert, Pentatonix and Ariana Grande, as well as Wicked's original witches, Adina Menzel and Kristen Chenoweth. The finale featured a number of former Elphabas and Glendas reuniting to sing for good. Laurel Harris was amongst the Elphabas invited to participate. That was truly so surreal. Talk about another moment of like, did that really just happen? <laughs> it's like, am I really on this stage with these idols that I've lived up to my whole life? The whole thing felt like kind of just like a dream. It was so big and it was so epic celebrating 15 years of the show that changed my life and changed so many people's lives. And then to be on that stage with the people that I saw it with originally, I mean, Adina Menzel and Kristen Chenoweth, are you kidding me? And, and there I'm, I'm there on that stage, it's just wild. It was so special to be on that stage with so many women that I admire, just like the most special the most special night and just truly an honor to be asked to do it, of course. Wicked has created many lifelong friendships over the years, but Wicked's immense popularity has inadvertently created something else as well. Hundreds of legal bootleg videos. Broadway performers have a bit of a love-hate relationship with bootlegs, and the cast of Wicked is no different. I don't know. I mean, I know that we're not supposed to have bootlegs, and the show is very much against them, obviously. And I will say, as a performer, like, I'm glad they exist, because, for instance, I was able to show my grandmother um, a clip of me singing Divine Gravity. It is really special. It's a, it's a moment captured moment in time captured forever or until someone deletes it. <laughs> it's weird because it's changing. It is a strong no-no. It's um, to a certain degree disrespectful to the actors and it's also putting out footage that's not really complimentary to the show. But now we're in this place where we're on Instagram and there's all these freaking channels and uh, Instagram handles that all they do is play theater bootlegs. And I subscribe to all of them. 
So if you're one of those bloggers or Instagram people out there, keep them coming because I'm watching. I'm totally into it. And it's also really nice because, you know, it's helping people see the show that might not be able to afford to see it otherwise. I know uh, from a business standpoint, the show frowns upon it. Every show frowns upon it. However, I think Wicked is doing just fine financially. It's not hurting anybody to have a few bootlegs going around and bringing some people some joy. But Wicked has a bigger problem than bootlegs, and it's a problem of its own creation. Wicked has repeatedly been criticized for a lack of diversity in its casting choices, especially when it comes to the role of Elphaba. In over 15 years and six separate productions, Wicked has only had a small handful of women of color play the role of Elphaba full-time in the U.S. Those that have include Eden Espinosa, Mandy Gonzalez, and Tony winner Lindsay Mendez. There have only been five black women to play the role in the U.S., with Tony nominee Sekon Singblo being the first, followed by Brandi Siobhan Massey, Danielle Williamson, Tony nominee Lily Cooper, and Emmy raver Lantman, all of whom were understudies and standbys for the role. The only black performer in the world to play the role of Elphaba full-time is Alexia Kadim, who played the role in the West End production in 2010. It's a shame and a bit of a shock that Wicked has never cast a black actor as Elphaba full-time in the U.S., especially considering how Elphaba's journey resonates with black audiences. Wicked's lead producer, Mark Platt, has gone out of his way several times to acknowledge that connection when speaking about the reaction to one of the show's first readings. An African-American woman with tears streaming down her face came up to me and said, You have told the story of black women in America. So if the producers know how much this story means to people of color, why is Elphaba almost always white? The blame falls completely and totally at the feet of Wicked's producers and casting directors. At the end of the day, Wicked is a story about racism. Who better to tell that story than people who have actually experienced racism firsthand? Wicked's history of exclusion casts a large, sad shadow over its otherwise wonderful legacy. In recent years, Wicked has made several casting decisions that have been steps in the right direction. In 2016, Broadway legend Cheryl Lee Ralph became the first black performer to play the role of Madame Morrible full-time on Broadway. Four years later, Transparent star Alexandra Billings would become the first openly trans performer to star in the role. And on January 10th, 2019, Brittany Johnson became the first black woman in the world to play the role of Glinda. The Gershwin was packed with people eager to see her history-making performance. The first thing I have an actual memory of is just hearing a roaring. It sounded like roaring in my ears. It was one of those moments that you feel like you are in your dream. Being the first black Glinda on Broadway is truly an honor. It's a dream come true for me, but it really is an honor to be the representative for other people's dreams and their goals and the things that they didn't think were possible. Now maybe they will, but maybe they will think it's possible. It's, it's so amazing just the, the outpouring of love and, I mean, people are telling me their dreams on social media and dreams that they had that they swept under the rug they're you know picking back out because I've shown them that something is possible I'm sorry <laughs> um, it really it means a lot Johnson would continue on as the Glinda understudy until July of 2019 when she became the official standby for the role 2019 was a record-breaking year for Broadway and for Wicked as well on October 28th, the show surpassed Les Miserables to become the fifth longest-running Broadway show of all time. Ticket sales remained as strong as ever, even with new hits like Hamilton taking the top spot at the box office. 2020 seemed poised to be yet another great year for Wicked and for all of Broadway, with a season full of exciting new shows and revivals, including a revival of Caroline or Change, a show that originally premiered during the 2003-2004 Broadway season with Wicked. But just one day before Caroline's first preview performance, the unthinkable would happen. On March 12, 2020, all of Broadway went dark due to the threat of the COVID-19 virus. For the first time in over 15 years, there was no production of Wicked playing anywhere in the world. As ghost lights continued to illuminate empty stages, 
Broadway's reigning Linda, Jenna Claire Mason, eagerly awaits her first day back in the bubble. At the end of the show, she says, we have been through a frightening time and there will be other times and other things that will frighten us. I think that line is going to land not only with me, but with the company and with the audience in a whole new way. Also, I mean, that first line that I get to come down and say, are you kidding? It's good to see me, isn't it? I think that's gonna be really, really special. And then I'm gonna get to celebrate my 1000th show. I think it's just gonna be incredibly exciting. It's gonna feel like a second opening night for, for all of Broadway. On February 12th, 2021, Wicked returned with a new production in Seoul, South Korea, proving that it will take more than a global pandemic to ever bring Wicked down. The Yellow Brick Road to Success was quite a bumpy one for Wicked. Any number of things from feuding creatives to Tony snubs could have brought the show crumbling down but over 15 years later, Wicked is still flying high. It's more than a musical. It's a pop culture phenomenon with a life of its own. For Good is sung at countless graduations every year. Popular gets performed at nearly every school talent show in America. And Defying Gravity has become an anthem for anyone who has ever felt held down. Wicked has connected with people in a way that very few Broadway musicals ever have. For the people who've brought the show to life over the years, Wicked was so much more than just a job. It was a dream come true. It's incredibly special. Um, it needs to be around for a very long time. It's a part of the fabric that makes me me. I'm so honored to still be in the family. I never saw that coming after years of not being on stage with it. And it's worth it. The show is worth it. The show is worth seeing. The show is worth experiencing. The show is worth sharing with people. Um, the show is worth your time. Take that, cats, now and forever. I'm proud that, you know, I'm a fat lady who got into that show, like, and that hopefully other fat ladies get to be in that part, dancing and singing and doing all the things. As a cast, we did some extraordinary things, especially with charities. And they're still my family. Like, when all this happened, like, they were the first people, you know, I reached out to and the same back. I, I just, I just love them. Can you tell? I just love them. It feels like such a big question to ask what Wicked means to me, just because it's been such a big part of my life for so long. It's become, you know, not only my livelihood, but a family, a community, and a story that I feel really proud of sharing. I also think what speaks to older audiences is, yes, the humor, but just this really moving story of friendship that kind of triumphs all odds, not judging a book by its cover. I think it's a message that is timeless because it's one that people need to hear time and time again. It's a production that I'm really, you know, that I loved growing up and watching and, and now that I just really feel honored to be a part of. And that's not every show. You don't, you don't get to, you know, every musical that you're a part of isn't a story you're incredibly passionate about. I mean, hopefully you are, but this is just a story that I feel really, really proud of getting to be part of. To get to play that role on that stage, it, I, I mean, like, I'm getting emotional <laughs> talking about it because, you know, you just never know. And I didn't know I was gonna get emotional, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it really is, it's, um. It's a dream. I mean, it was a dream that became a reality. And that show means more to me than any show that I've ever done. And it always will. It will always have the most special place in my heart because it proved to me that I could do it and that, um, you know, anything is possible. And every single time I got to play that role on tour and at the Gershwin, I always look up during Defying Gravity. I, I remember where I was sitting and I'm, I'm singing to that young person sitting in that chair who has the same aspirations that I did. I hope that in that moment I'm able to inspire someone who is in a similar place that I was at when I first saw that number in that show. She's nothing to do with it. I'm the one you want. It's me. Help me. It's me.
you don't match them in green now. 